I'll struggle with that, but I will read it. Okay, so by way of announcements tonight, um, just to let my youth know before I forget about it, after offering, after we've seen congregation offering, we'll go over to the Life Center. I know it's cold, um, and I wouldn't take you over there on most nights, but we're going over there anyway, so we're just going to go ahead and go over there after offering, and the congregation will go over there. Uh, by way of announcements, um, remember the Operation Christmas Child. We are trying to make a push to get all our gifts we need for the year. So if you haven't signed up to um, get gifts or give money in the box there to pay for gifts, uh, please pray about that and do that so we can meet our goal there. Um, the new Baptist bread is in. For those of you that uh, participate with that and follow that, it is in in the vestibule there uh, if you're interested in that. Um, Couples Retreat will be uh, November 3rd and 4th, and then Chosen Road, November 12th at 6 p.m. Our packing party for Operation Christmas Child, November 19th, after the evening service. Christmas Choir Special, December 7th. I love seeing Christmas in the bulletin. That gets me fired up. I love Christmas time. I don't know if you guys know that, but I love it. Um, Christmas Play and Party, uh, December 17th. And uh, in uh, reference to the play, we got play practice next Sunday. Next Sunday at 5 p.m. So if you're participating, I like it. If you're participating in the Christmas play, it'll be next Sunday. Practice, will, not the play, but practice will be next Sunday at 5 p.m. Um, if you have any questions about that, please see Miss Shannon. Um, and then Christmas Eve, or we'll have a, an 11 a.m. service only. And as Brother Stephen mentioned this morning, I don't know if you heard him, um, if you don't see that in the bulletin um, consistently up until that time, it's not because we're not doing it. It's just that this is just a, hey, this is what we're going to be doing in December, just to let you know what's up. And who knows, Brother Stephen may have forgot it. I don't know, but just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just, just kidding. Just playing. Just playing. I shouldn't. <laughs> just kidding, man. Okay, so I've got a card here. Please bear with me. I'm terrible at reading cursive. If anybody else would rather come read this, that'd be great. Uh, all right, I don't, I don't want to be the one to botch it, so I'll let's I, do what? I can see it, but I just don't want to botch it, and then somebody get mad that I didn't say the words right. So I'll let Brother Stephen read that one. Um, thank you to whoever brought it, and uh, Brother Stephen will read that for us. That way I don't mess up what you said, because I'm sure it was beautiful. But uh, uh, are, there any other, are there any other announcements tonight? Lord, have you. Any other announcements? Anything that I forgot about? I'm ready to sit down now. <laughs> If there are no other announcements, we get our ushers to come for our Sunday evening offering. And remember, this is the uh, offering for our the missions we support. And I will ask Brother Adam Campbell to pray for us.
May stand and turn to page 59. Jesus loves even me. get this note out of the way now. Yes, amen. I'm trying to. Dear friends at Calvary, on behalf of the Longhorn Touchdown Club, the football team, and Coach Curley, I'd like to thank you for the delicious meal you prepared for the team on September the 7th. The guys definitely enjoyed the hamburgers and the hot dogs, and they greatly appreciate your hard work and generosity. May God continue to bless you and your ministry in our county. God bless you. Uh, Annette Greer, and she's responsible for getting that together. We appreciate them, and uh, that's been uh, back in September. We uh, fed the football team, so I uh, did that one Thursday afternoon. Brother Tyler had the opportunity to, uh, to uh, no, Brother Tyler didn't. I think, uh, I believe I shared with him that night. Did I, Warren? Were you there? I believe I did. Brother Tyler had to work late that day or something. You've got a Bible with you tonight. We're going to be going back to the book of Genesis. We're again reading from chapter number 42, uh, chapter number 42 of Genesis. And how many of you think it's cold in here? How many of you think it's hot in here? 
Well, I think we'll be okay just to move our service over to the tabernacle. It feels pretty good out there. Y'all, y'all want to go and just grab a chair as we go? Yeah, I got a few shaking heads on that. I, y'all go ahead if you want to. I'm going to stay over here, I believe. <laughs> A little chilly this evening, but we think the Lord's nice and warm in here. Uh, Genesis chapter number 42, we're going to read uh, these same verses we read again this morning. Just uh, finish up with the thought that we began this morning. Uh, stand with us as we read together. Genesis 42, beginning in verse number 1. I don't, the brother Tyler mentioned the Baptist bread was out in the vestibule if you need one of those. If you don't have a good devotion, uh, this is a good one, very trustworthy. Pick one of those up. Now the Bible says, when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look one upon another? And he said, behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren were down, went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, Lest peradventure mischief shall befall him. And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them, and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. And Joseph remembered, let's read this again, Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them and said to them, Ye are spies, to see the nakedness of the land, ye are come. Father, we are very thankful this afternoon that we can come together again to gather around a portion of your word. Lord, I pray that uh, whatever is necessary tonight, that you would do that. Help us to prepare our heart, God. I realize that sometimes we allow things into our lives it may be a hindrance it might be uh, lord a hindrance to the way that you would like to work in our lives i i pray father that uh, this evening that each of us would search his heart that you would help us show us anything that may be amiss that we could confess it before you be forgiven of it lord that you'd have the freedom to move in our hearts the way that you would so desire lord bless these young folks as they go over brother tyler tonight I pray that you'd bless him and help him. And uh, God, I, I pray that you would have your way here tonight. Uh, God, I pray that you would lead us as we read the Scripture and impart to us some spiritual truth that we can take and put into practice in our lives, Lord, that would make us better suited to serve you. Help us to be mindful of the needs of others. There are some that are sick tonight. Lord, there are some that are hurting. Some couldn't be here, Lord. For whatever reason, we pray you'd bless them, help them where they are. God, as we celebrate today, Pastor Appreciation Day, Lord, I want to thank you for the pastors that I've had in the past. God, I thank you so much for their leadership, their wisdom. God, I thank you so much for the pastors that have stood where I stand now throughout the years. Lord, there have been many good men Uh, that you've used here at this church. And Lord, it's by their leadership that this church has stayed true to your word. And I thank you so much, God, for their guidance. I thank you so much that you kept your hand upon them. Lord, I I pray that you'd just bless now and help us to follow you in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're continuing on. We talked about uh, this morning keeping the faith. We talked about uh, the fact that Joseph uh, had a very uh, had a a lot of adversity in his life, and uh, he still seemed to serve God. There's nothing recorded negatively about Joseph anywhere in the Scripture. So I hold him up as an example to you, and as, as an example to me, uh, that we should really pattern our life. Uh, after his manner of living. That would be a, 
uh, a great uh, pattern for you and I to follow. Certainly, uh, he's a great pattern. He's a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the suffering that he had was undeserved. And uh, he willingly endured that suffering uh, so that he might fulfill the will of God. And certainly that in itself is a picture of what Christ has done for us. Now tonight, uh, we're going to continue on this thing for just a, a few minutes. We talked about this morning the how that Jacob or how that Joseph clinged to the revelation of God's will to him, uh, that God showed him what he was going to do in his life, and he, he reassured him with his word. The Bible says there in Verse number 9, that Joseph remembered the dreams that he dreamed. Now, uh, tonight we're going to talk about, uh, is if we're talking about keeping the faith, there's one more thing that I'd like to add to this. And I'm not, not going to take a great deal of time tonight. But uh, lastly, uh, I, I want to add to this, the, uh, J- Joseph realized, or he had a realization of God's way. Verse number 9 says again, And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed, and he said, Ye are spies to see the nakedness of the land, ye are come. Now, uh, that, uh, uh, that, those words, ye, ye are come. So he realized uh, God's will for his life. He realized God's way in his life right there at that spot. I believe that Joseph could look back at his life and he could measure the way that God had worked. Joseph uh, was really... I guess he was probably at that time 40, 42 years old, and he had, had lived through a lot of adversity, and he'd lived long enough to learn some things, but he was still uh, young enough maybe to, uh, to enjoy good health and a good mind. But uh, uh, he could look back and, and see in his life how God had moved to prepare him, to mold him, and to make him into the man that he was uh, at that time. And you and I should be able to do that. I'm thankful today that I can look back and know definitely, even through adversity in my life, that God was molding me. God was making me what He wanted me to be so that I would be able to do what He's called me to do today. Now, uh, there'll be things on down the road that uh, that God will call each of us to do. We should be able to look back and, and see how God was molding us. Now, uh, Joseph could see that. You see, he realized it was God's way to prepare him. God always prepares his people for what's coming in their life. Now, if we think about the life of Joseph, Joseph certainly he was a good businessman. He was a very shrewd businessman. He knew how to deal with people. He knew how to deal with facts. He knew how to deal with figures. And we know that because he excelled in everything that he did, right? Everywhere that he went, he seemed to excel. God had his hand on him. Now, if you look back and think about the life of Joseph, he had seen some some very shrewd business dealings inside his own family. He had seen the success of Jacob, for one. We know uh, that Jacob was not, not always completely honest in his dealings, but later in his life certainly he was, and God had his hand on Jacob, and, and, and Joseph was a witness to much of that. He saw the success of his father, and he undoubtedly learned some of the do's and don'ts right uh, at the feet of his dad. Now, uh, Joseph also would remember back to the time that uh, he and his dad and his family, all these brethren, dwelled back with uh, uh, with Laban, his actually uh, his granddad, and he would have saw uh, not only the success of Jacob, but he would have saw uh, the the shadiness in the dealings of Laban. Laban, you remember, if you read those stories back uh, in Genesis, uh, I'll just read you a little bit from Genesis 31. Uh, Jacob is, is speaking here. It says, These twenty years have I been with thee, speaking to Laban, and it said, Thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast their young, and the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. That which was torn to beast I brought not unto thee, I bear the loss of it, and my 
my hand, of my hand didst thou require, whether stolen by day or by night. Thus I was in the day that the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from mine eyes, and thus have I been twenty years in thy house. He said, I served thee fourteen years for thy two daughters, and six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages ten times, except the God of my father, and the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely thou had sent me away now empty. And God has seen mine affliction, and the labor of my hands, and, and rebuked thee yesternight. Now, that's, the, that's Jacob speaking of his father-in-law Laban and, and he was a very shrewd businessman in fact he was a very shady businessman he changed he, he deceived Jacob numerous times on, on several different occasions he really got he didn't have much when Jacob first came to dwell with him but over the 20 years that Jacob was there God really blessed him for Jacob's sake it was Jacob, Jacob's dealings that uh, uh, that God blessed him for, but he kept trying. Uh, he kept trying to uh, change J uh, Joseph's, or, or uh, he, he kept trying to change Jacob's wages around, and he kept trying uh, to take advantage of him. And Joseph saw all these things. So uh, the moral of that was Joseph knew not to trust people too much. You don't trust them too far. You always make sure that you understand what you're getting into. When you, Whenever you get into a business deal, you want to find as much information as you can get. You don't want to trust anybody too much, right? You remember, many of you old enough to remember what Ronald Reagan said to Mikhail uh, Gorbachev back in the 80s, uh, he said, trust but verify. You remember that? Trust but verify. And that, that's actually from an old uh, uh, Russian proverb that he was, uh, uh, that somebody briefed him on. And that's a very good saying, trust but verify. And that's what Joseph would have did. Uh, just, Joseph didn't trust men, he trusted God. And he made sure that he used every bit that God had given him, every bit of the wisdom that God had given him to make sure that he didn't get taken advantage of. You, you trust too much, you, uh, you wound up getting taken advantage of. And Joseph had a good business sense about him. Now, God prepared him to deal with business. And he did that in Potiphar's house. He did that down at the jail. He did that certainly as the prime minister of Egypt. Now, God prepared him also to deal with temptation. There was many, uh, many times of temptation in the life of Joseph. You, you think about the verses back there in Genesis where, where it talks about Potiphar's wife uh, trying to tempt Joseph and how uh, that that must have, uh, she was after him. The Bible says day by day and it must have worn on him after some time. But Joseph was equipped to deal with temptation. He, he had been uniquely prepared to deal with temptation. Again, if you study the life of Joseph and go back and look, you'll find that he had been exposed to uh, to, to sexual immorality in his family and he saw the cost of that and I believe that that was part of the reason that he didn't fall for the temptation. In fact, he saw his oldest brother. He saw Reuben, the Bible says, he went and, and, and took his father's concubine and he had relations with her. And, and because of that, uh, Jacob and Reuben were estranged. Because of that, uh, Reuben didn't get the blessing. Actually, uh, Jacob, Actually, Joseph got the double portion that should have fallen to Reuben because Reuben was sexually immoral. And that cost him quite a bit. And Joseph saw that. Not only that, but he saw that his sister Dinah had been taken advantage of. The Bible tells us, if we go to uh, Genesis 34, in verse 1 and 2, Dinah, the daughter of Lee, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land, and when Shechem, uh, Shechem the, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and laid with her and defiled her. So he saw sexual immorality on the part of his sister, and he saw that two of his other brothers, actually in a, in a means 
to or are acting out in a means to revenge or avenge her uh, 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 the way that she was defiled, they slew a whole little town. They they slew a whole little village. All the men of that village and Joseph saw what that moment of sexual immorality cost uh, because of Dinah and this other man and because of Reuben and this concubine. And I believe that's how uh, that he was equipped to deal with temptation in his life. He understood what would happen if he gave in to this temptation. He, and I believe that he could look back and put his finger on that and know for sure why God didn't let him fall for that temptation. God exposed him to that in a sense I, I believe that I believe Joseph if you think about it may have been inoculated to some of those things you know what they do when when they when they uh, give you a vaccine they call it inoculated I think Barney called it inoculated I believe he said you remember that uh, he called it inoculated but most of the time, if I'm not mistaken, and I didn't search this out because it just struck me, but some of you may can correct me on this, but I believe the way that vaccinations are done generally is you get a small dose of the, the disease, a small dose of the virus, something like that, uh, and, and, and that build, helps your body build up immunity to it. I think that's a good way of saying that, that Joseph was inoculated against these sexual temptations because he already saw the result of that in the life of his family, and he didn't want that for himself. Now, you know, many times children today, we think about how that, you know, children, we look at them and oftentimes we, we have a saying, it's monkey see, monkey do, right? It, uh, what, whatever, however how you raised, a lot of times that's the way that you're going to behave. But, you know, that's not always the case. Sometimes you find a child that comes out of a terrible background that comes out of drugs and alcohol, or maybe comes out of a background where they're uh, exposed to sexual immorality all the time, and they, they don't have anything to do with that. If they're, they're, they don't have anything to do with drugs. They don't believe in drinking. Why? Because they've seen too much of it. They've seen the effects of it, and they don't want anything to do. I think that's probably what happened right here with Joseph. He had seen the effects of that kind of life, and he didn't want that for himself. He knew that God would not want that for him. So he'd seen enough of that that he was prepared to deal with temptation. Not only that, this man was prepared to deal with submission. Now, uh, Joseph had to, had to exercise a lot of submission in his life, right? He, he first submitted himself to his father. Actually, it seems like he, he may, uh, other than maybe Benjamin, he may have been the only trustworthy kid that Jacob seemed to have, especially when they were much younger. He, he in fact, he, he brought up the evil report of the other, uh, the other ten brethren there to his dad. He told dad what they were doing, and that gave them more encouragement to hate him because he did good and they didn't and, and just by his goodness it was shown that their evil was kind of exposed you know that's another similarity to Jesus when Jesus was in the world and you saw his purity it was easy to spot somebody else's pollution you know it, it, it's easy for me to stack myself up beside some human being and think well compared to so and so I look pretty good but you know when you stack yourself up beside a perfect and pure and holy Jesus it's pretty easy to see how polluted I am how nasty of a sinner that I am you, you see God prepared him to deal with submission. He was trusted by Jacob. He submitted to him. He was trusted by Potiphar. He submitted to him. He was trusted by the warden. He submitted to them. Both these men, he was the top man in, in Potiphar's house. He was a top man. He, he, he was the head trustee. He was second in charge there to Potiphar. He was second in charge there uh, to the warden. He was second in charge eventually uh, to 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 Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So he learned about submission. You know, and I got to thinking about that. And Joseph, pretty much everywhere he went, he was a number two man, wasn't he? He seemed to be the number two man. 
I thought about that a lot. You know, I, I don't know, we think about our lives, and I can look back at several times in my life, the things that it seems like God has uh, given me gifts for, maybe, or abilities for. seems like I, I, I never was the best at anything. I got to think about that. There, there was always somebody around who might have been a little bit better, you know. And I, I, I thought, well, you know, I was pretty good at something, but it seemed like there's always somebody around that, that was a little bit better, you know. And I, I, I think I can kind of identify with that. You may have took second place a lot of times. And I, and I thought about that in the life of Joseph, thought about that in my own life. And, you know, I believe God's used that to help me because here I am in second place today. I'm, I'm following God. I'm being submissive to God. I, I, I'm not a top man. You know, I, I'm, I'm, and, and neither are you. And de- neither was Joseph. You know, we submit to somebody else. There's somebody else over me. And I, throughout the years, God has taught me how to submit to authority. God has taught me how to do that so that I'd be able to submit to Him today. And He taught Joseph how to do that. He placed him in positions where he had no choice but to submit to those that were over him so that he would submit himself ultimately to God. When he was submitting to Potiphar, when he was submitting to the warden, when he was submitting to to the king of Egypt, he was really submitting to God. You know, and I look back at my life and think about the people that I've submitted to, the bosses maybe that I have submitted to through the years, and, 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 and it's God was teaching me to submit to Him. God was preparing Him to submit. He, he was trusted by all these men, but He was trusted by God. Now, he realized it was God's way to prepare him. God prepared him to deal in business. God prepared him to deal with temptation. God prepared him to deal with submission. God also prepared him to give forgiveness. To give forgiveness. He had a lot to forgive these brothers of, didn't he? If you study Joseph's life, and boy, they really mistreat. Can you imagine any brother? I, I remember growing up, and, and I have two brothers. My oldest brother's... Many of you know he's 10 years older than me, and he was really more like a dad than a brother, but my middle brother's three years older than me, and, and uh, boy, we used to treat each other pretty bad sometimes. Uh, we, I, I can't tell you the time we'd black one another's eyes and, and, and done all kinds of things. We, we just, we was rough, and we roughed a lot, and you know, he's three years older than me, 30, 40 pounds uh, uh, heavier than me, so I'd hit him and run. And boy, when he caught me, he was on then. Yeah, I'd get the worst end of the deal, but he'd know that I'd been there when we got done. But, you, you know, I think about that a lot. And there, there were times that, you know, I, I guess maybe I thought in my mind when I was upset that I really, uh, and I probably, I, you know, I probably said I hated him, but I never did. I loved him. You know, and I, I still do today. And I, I think about the things that we went through, the hardships that we went through as kids and how we had our hard times with one another. And, boy, there wasn't nothing like Jacob and his problem with his brethren. They sold him into slavery. They mistreated him. And they, they really probably laughed and mocked at his tears when he, when he left. And they left him for dead. I mean, they, he was dead to them. They hated him. I couldn't imagine that in a family. I, you know, we had our bumps and bruises and our fights and our, our arguments. But, you know, family's family. And, and you, you, you know, it, it's... Um, we might have fought each other, but there but not nobody else jump in there. He what, probably wouldn't have been pretty. Uh, you, you see, but, but his life wasn't like that. He had to learn to forgive. Where did he learn that at? Well, you know, one good example of that is Esau. You know, if you study, and I'm assuming that you know a lot of this. If you come out here at 35 degrees on Sunday night and wind blowing like it is tonight, you probably read your Bible a time or two. Um, and, and you know a little bit of the history with Jacob and Esau, Joseph's dad and Joseph's uncle. And you know that, that Jacob, you understand that he stole his brother's birthright. His brother was, was born first, so he should have had the double portion. But, but he, at the insistence of his mother, tricked his dad and stole his birthright. He stole the blessing. He stole the birthright. And, and you see, Esau, for a while hated Jacob. In fact, Jacob ran to Laban uh, uh, in an effort to get away from Esau because he thought that Esau was going to kill him. Now, after he had been gone 
20 years, he came back. And in Genesis uh, chapter number 33, verse number 1, it says, Jacob lifted up his eyes. This is when he's coming back. And he looked, and behold, and Esau came, and with him 400 men. Can you imagine what Jacob must have thought? Man, they're going to cut me down. It's, it's, he, he actually separated his children. He, he, said, uh, 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 he said his concubines with their children, and he said uh, both his wives with their children, and he set some distance between them, and then he went out before them, and he thought there was going to be a fight. Now, it says that, uh, that he, he divided the children to Leah and Rachel to the two handmaids and he put the handmaids and their children foremost and Leah and her children after and Rachel and Joseph in the most and he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And it says that Esau, whom he feared, Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and he fell on his neck and he kissed him, and they wept. You see, he forgave his brother. He had already let that go. And this is proof the way that he embraced him. They didn't run to one another in that time. It wasn't dignified for a man to run and certainly to scoop up somebody else. But this is the kind of greeting that they would have expected one from another to, to bow, to, to hug, and maybe even kiss on the cheek at that time. So he received him like a long-lost relative. He received him with love. He forgave him. And Joseph was there to see that. He saw that, and I believe it made an impression on him. Not only that... But Joseph had seen that forgiveness. He had had to forgive Potiphar's wife for what she did. He had forgiven the butler there that forgot him. And he had to, he had to have already forgiven his brethren. Now what they did to him wasn't right. They, they uh, used him. They sold him. They didn't care for his life. They, they didn't receive him. He was their brethren. There again, a picture of Jesus. Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not. Same thing. Jesus cried on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And you see, Joseph forgave his brethren. He forgave his brethren. And you and I must forgive. God prepared him to do this. God prepared his heart that he might do this. You see, jo uh, Joseph realized it was God's way to prepare him. Not only that, God's way to promote him. Look at verse number 6. It says, Joseph was governor over the land. You see, God, it was God's idea to fulfill this, to promote him. That was the promise. That, that was the promise. That was the dream that he had that God would place him in a, in a position of power. That was the promise that God had made to him. And he realized it was God's way to promote him. You know, I don't know what your station is in this life, but we ought to be satisfied that it's God who ordains us. It's God who puts us where we are. Uh, I, I, I believe, and I try to preach the best I can. I try to pastor the best I can. I'm not perfect, but uh, I believe that God placed me here. And uh, I, I'm thankful for that. I know that I'm unworthy. I'm undeserving. But I'm thankful that He placed me, and I believe that He placed you. And I thank God that He placed you. You, you see, it's God's way to promote us. That, that was His promise. That was His pattern. Not only that, but you see, He realized it was not only God's way to prepare Him, God's way to promote Him, but it was God's way to preserve them all. It was God's way to preserve this whole family. You see, uh, slavery delivered Joseph from death. Um, Genesis Chapter number uh, 38, verse 26 and, and 27 tells us that, that it was slavery. It was uh, Judah again there. If you want to turn and look at that, uh, 38, 26, and 27 very quickly. It says, And Judah acknowledged them and said, uh, that's, I wrote down the wrong verse. Maybe it's 39. Nope. Here's
Here we go, 37, 26 and 27 says, And Judah said to his brethren, What, what profit is it if we shall slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let our, not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and, our, and his brethren were content. He would have died right there in that pit. He would have died in that pit if God had not seen to it that there was some way of escape. And you see, the slavery delivered him from death. Not only that, but prison delivered him from immorality. He, he was vexed, I can imagine, every day with the advances of this lady, Potiphar's wife. He, he was tried every day, tempted every day, and it's this, it, it was this prison that got him out of that situation, that God used to get him out of that situation, that God used, him, that, God used that prison to get him to meet this other man, uh, these, uh, this chief butler. That, that was close to Pharaoh so that he would eventually get an audience with Pharaoh that he would help him to, to discern or, or he would help him to understand his dream and, and that he would be ultimately pr promoted. You see, the whole ordeal here delivered a nation. How do you know that? Look at, look at chapter number 45. The Bible says, And then Joseph could not refrain himself before them uh, that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from him, and there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known to his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard, and Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said to his brethren, Come near, I pray you. And they, they came near and said, I, He said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold to Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved or angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. God sent me to preserve life. For these two years have the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing or harvest, and God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. Does that sound like he understood what God had been doing in the past? That it's not you but he said, God sent me here. He said that God sent me and that he had made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. So he realized it was God's way to preserve them all. Prison uh, may have delivered him from immorality, uh, but this, uh, this uh, uh, deliverance for the nation came by being subservient, by being submissive to Pharaoh. God delivered this whole nation by placing Joseph where he was at the time that he was there. All so he could fulfill the promise in Genesis 12. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get thee out from thy, of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house to a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. You see, God always keeps his word. And he was doing all this to preserve Israel. Keep your finger right there. Turn to 1 Peter. If God kept his word to Abraham, he'll keep his word to you and I. 1 Peter chapter number 1. I read this to the kids Wednesday night. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, there's a place that God has that's waiting on us as His children. It's reserved in heaven 
And if it, it fadeth not away, and if God kept His promise to Abraham, He'll keep His promise to you and I. God goes to great lengths to fulfill His promises. I don't know about you, but I thank the Lord for that. Now, you want to learn about uh, keeping the faith in adversity the way that Joseph did? That next verse in Peter says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye shall be in heaven as through manifold temptations at the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found to the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, Joseph's faith was, was tried through the fire. His faith was purified through adversity. Your faith will be purified through adversity. We need to realize God's way. Be able to look back and see and know how God worked in our lives. And that gives us in turn, that gives us encouragement to know that God is still working today. The same God that worked in Abram's life, that worked in Jacob's life, that worked in Joseph's life, works in your life. And you need to realize He has a plan for you. Oftentimes that plan includes some adversity. But it's for your good. It certainly was for Joseph's good and our good. Do you know Jesus is your Savior? Father, I, I pray tonight that you've touched each and, each and every heart. I realize on a Sunday night with the weather bad, probably everybody out here really wanted to be here. And I thank you for that. But Lord, there could be some here not in a right relationship with you. I pray that they would not see it, not be able to rest. God, not be able to get any comfort until they turn to you. Help us, God. We're thankful that we see in the past that you were always faithful in fulfilling your promises. So we know that follows in the future, you will fulfill your promises to us. I'm thankful for this place called heaven we can look forward to. Lord, we know it's been paid for by the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Stand to your feet. Do you need to come to the altar? Realize God's way in your life. Can you look back and see His work? Maybe you'd just like to thank Him. Come to this altar. Lord, I, I've gone through some hard times. But I can look back and see your hand at work in my life. And I, I thank you for that, Lord. I, I know you've been there with me. Over the course of your life, if you found God faithful, would you come maybe just cry out to Him tonight? Just thanking Him, praising Him. You're here tonight and you need to know Jesus. You can take Him at, at His word. He says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wouldn't you like to know you have a place reserved in heaven? It's as simple as admitting your sin, believing on Jesus. You asked Him, you pray like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died for me. I want to be cleansed. I want to be forgiven. I want to be a new creature. Please come into my heart and forgive me. If you pray like that, this is the Lord to save you. If you're far from Him, farther than you want to be, you pray and ask Him to help you. You confess your sin and forsake it, and He will. Do you need to come? Any others tonight? Any others? Would you come?
many others. Well, again, we do thank you for coming tonight. Don't forget, we're going to have a fellowship over at the Life Center. It should be nice and warm there. It might be a little cool getting over there, but it won't take uh, too long. We appreciate you all coming tonight. Stay neat with us. Brother A.J., would you close us in prayer and ask a blessing on the food over at the Life Center?
make you pray that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You fought a little.